this 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 is gonna be his legacy this will be his legacy we will make sure that this is on his tombstone he saved the suit and yet and yet they've they've done nothing nothing whatsoever to help bring down childhood poverty um nothing to help working people nothing to make lives better revive the american dream invest in the future none of that none of that but the suit that's that's what what has to happen and and i gotta be honest with you i i don't care whether you wear a suit or not i i you know, I actually think you should dress appropriately in 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 institution of high esteem. I do have some 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 beliefs that you should, uh, you know, show respect. Uh, I wouldn't show up in, in sweatpants and a t-shirt to 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 a Senate hearing. But is this the biggest problem a U.S. senator has, when West Virginia is one of the poorest states in the entire country? And and I would have to ask. How many people in West Virginia could afford a suit? Now, this is one of these moments where my mind goes, I want average, everyday working people in the halls of power. I want a truck driver, an electrician, a carpenter. I want somebody like that to be able to go to the Senate and help make laws to make people's lives better. And I get that, you know what, suits are expensive. And if that were the argument that, you know, hey, you know, I'm struggling, but I'm going to wear decent clothes. I'm going to wear my Sunday best. How many people in West Virginia don't have a suit? How many people in this country can't afford to dress in a suit every day? Uh, this is this is elitism. This is snobbish. This is ridiculous. Because, again, if if all of our problems were solved, if we didn't have one of the highest child poverty rates uh, in, in our country's history, if we didn't have homeless veterans, if we didn't have people who, who can't afford to buy a home, if we, if, if we solved all of that, then you go, hey, you know, we did all the other work. It's time to talk about dumb stuff. But yet the guy who was the driver, one of two Democratic votes along with every Republican, to make child poverty great again in this country. This is what he chooses to do. Now, again, this is what's made the right lose their mind. They're, oh my gosh, they're they're defacing. <laughs> you know, the people who, who defecated in the halls of the Capitol, they're concerned about people wearing suits now. If you listen to right-wing blather, this was an issue. I can't believe it's an issue, but it is. And you know, today I, I spent a couple of minutes doing the the rounds of the of the dial, uh, listening to the right wing bloviators, uh, our outrage merchants on the right, and and it was interesting listening to them complain about how Joe Biden has increased childhood poverty. It's interesting how they're able to spin that, because not one Republican, not one conservative, not one good God fearing, child loving conservative voted to feed hungry children oh rick you're 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 being hyperbolic childhood poverty just went up by 60 percent because we gutted a program that we found that worked if you give families an extra 250 bucks a month in assistance to make sure that they can put up food on the table they do it's amazing how that happens. And yet, because of our esteemed senator from West Virginia, and again, every single Republican. Now, what's interesting is I had this little back and forth today. Because the Tim Scott thing, um, just just ridiculous. The fact that Tim Scott said that every, every worker who strikes should be fired got the attention of a small Republican party chair or you know a small republican party uh you know, county committee in in minnesota and and good on them for you know calling on tim scott to recant the comments 
But I said, you know, look, Republicans hate working people. Look at what they do. And, and I say this all the time. There's nothing new here. Anybody who listens to the show knows that's what I believe because it's what I've seen. Uh, don't tell me things. Don't give me don't give me words. Show me. Give me actions. And the actions have all been, hey, let's let's attack working people. And it's it's what they've done. So I, I went, we, we had this little back and forth, and, and I said, look, Tim Scott is another Republican who hates working people. Republicans hate working people. And, you know, th they responded with, a, you know, this is a funny thing to post on a post by Republicans denouncing anti-worker crap from Tim Scott. And, and look, the reality is, uh, on an individual level to an individual Republican, yeah, uh, good on you for, for coming out and speaking up. But don't, but excuse me for not, not applauding you or praising you for being part of a party that on the national stage, when they had their little presidential debate, when all of those, those, those people who are, and wait for the next debate, they're going to all be trying to trip over themselves to attack the UAW members and the workers who are demanding better wages, hours, conditions. They are going to trip over themselves to, to echo what Tim Scott and Nikki Haley have been saying. But excuse me for, for looking at the Republican Party who has pushed policy, who has an agenda to destroy workers' rights, who keeps appointing people to positions of power uh, on, on courts across this country who are destroying the ability to fight for those better wages, hours, conditions. Excuse me for not bowing down and going, oh, my God, a good Republican. There's one. There's one. And look, I, I applaud you personally. I got a question why you're part of a party who hates working people. But this is what it is. The, the fact that individually you've come out against it doesn't forgive your party from doing all of the horrible stuff that they have done the last 40 years. I keep coming back to working class issues. They resonate with voters. Bidenomics is actually resonating with workers. When you start talking about jobs, you start talking about the economy, when you start actually doing something. Now, again, I go back to, 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 to Trump. Now, remember, Trump is the standard bearer for the Republican Party, a guy who has crossed the picket line. He is a scab, crossed the picket line. That's who the Republican Party is. Now, there may be some individuals who hang around and say, no, no, that's not me. Well, you're guilty by association because your party hates working people. Look at the policy. Don't care about your words. And now look at the words of the, the, the leaders of the party. But here's the thing. When Donald Trump was in office, and, and look, I, I gave the racists and the misogynists and the homophobes a, a, a small pass. I know people on the left think every Trump voter is a racist, a homophobe, and a misogynist. Uh, I don't believe that. I think in, in, in 2016, there were some people who believed uh, Trump was going to be the guy who was going to bring jobs back. He was going to be the guy who was going to save the auto industry. And remember the Lordstown lie. Let's never forget that. Because there were people whose lives have been upended because they didn't take job transfers because they believed Trump. They stayed in the Lordstown area. They stayed because, hey, Trump's going to bring those jobs back. He's going to bring back he's going to bring back the golden age of the economy. Because Trump is a good con man. He's a good used car salesman. He sold a good portion of this population on the idea that he was going to be the one to bring back the prosperous past. The jobs that were able to support a family. And you know what's interesting to me? All of those Trump supporters, all of those red hats who are attacking Sleepy Joe or, you know, Dementia Joe or whatever they come up with. He's actually the guy who's doing all of the things that they thought Trump was going to do. And that's what I just find kind of ironic, which is why Bidenomics is working. And when you start talking about the things that they're doing, it resonates with people. And once we can get past the red hat, blue hat stuff and start talking about, oh, I don't know, green? I think you're going to have people come around.
Now, like I said, you know, the right wing outrage machine, all they keep feeding people is, you know, Joe Biden increased child poverty. Never a mention, <laughs> nary a mention that every Republican voted against continuing that child tax credit. That to me. And look, you know, part of me says it's just them, you know, being dishonest, uh, being dis disingenuous, cherry picking their information, you know, having to be on on script because we've got to attack Joe Biden at every opportunity. But part of me goes, I don't think they care because they know what they're feeding their audience. Now, Rupert Murdoch, the head of Fox, stepped down today. I guess his son's now going to take over. We'll see how crazy Fox gets now. But the fact that he said, look, Sean Hannity's retarded, and so are so is half the American people. That's what he thinks of the people who watch Fox News. So when do we go, no, we're not going to do this anymore? I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Show .com. Are, are you as upset about the whole suit thing as I am? Because it's just got me. It's got me. It's got me pretty upset. Let's go with that. Uh, I can't say the real words. Uh, the truck driver and me will come out, and that is a bad thing. I don't have the money to pay the FCC fines. Uh, but I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Show .com. Quick break. Right back after this. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. The phone lines are open. Give Rick a call at 1-866-416-RICK. That's 1-866-416-7425. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. I, I love John Fetterman's comment yesterday. He said, if those jagoffs in the House stop trying to shut our government down and fully support Ukraine, then I will save democracy by wearing a suit on the Senate floor next week. And and I would have added, you know, hey, you know, pass a bill that ends childhood poverty. And and maybe he'll wear a, you know, a zoot suit. Who knows? Uh, you know, I'll dress up as a clown. I'll do whatever you want. Just get things done. Let's go to the phones. Got Alice on one. Alice, how are you? Insane. Insane. I got it. <laughs> so is Sarah Burris on tonight? No. Oh, darn. She is but in Las anyways. Vegas. Oh, well, I hope she wins big. <laughs> Makes so I knew they were going. I knew they were going to do this over the suit. The dress code. Remember a few days back when I called in and said that I really didn't care what they wore as long as they did their work because I knew they were going to do this. And you know, Joe Manchin, he just jumps right in there. <sighs> it's crazy. That's the right response right but, there. That's the right response. Uh, yeah. I know. It, uh, it's just, you just shake your head and go, really? What are you all supposed to be doing besides getting outraged over? You know, make believe stuff and stuff that you just come up with because you got to make it look like you're doing something. Yep. But uh, I was amused, I guess is the word I want to say, to see that uh, Fox is being put under new management, so to speak. I'm just wondering if the son is as greedy and as um, 
inclined to twist things as his daddy is. I'm going to go five times worse. Oh, wonderful. Just what we need. So we're, we're saying now that they're going to be right along with uh, that ON or ONN or whatever it is. And, I think they're uh, going to they're gonna make crazy great again. Oh, wonderful. Well, I guess we should set back with our popcorn and see, you know, just how crazy they can go. Frankly, I think we ought to pass some new laws. You know, first of all, we need to, number one, Joe needs to go. We need to build some more mental health facilities. And then we need to pass a law that says, if you start, you know, saying certain things, and I really don't want to hear that you can't do it because it's against somebody's rights. I really don't want to hear that. I don't care because the Republicans wouldn't care. Well, we used so to do it. Start, we used to do it back in the old days, Alice. You, if you acted up in public a little bit too much, you know, the guys with the white coats would come by and take you away. Here, we got a nice jacket for you. It's got long sleeves. Hey, I think we need to bring it back. I'm telling you, <laughs> you know, it's just crazy. We, we need to do these things because the insanity is multiplying daily. And I'm just going, you know, I often wonder about my own mental health, but that, that's a normal thing. So for y'all out there, if you wonder about your mental health and you think that you're crazy, you're not. There you go. Because if, well, that's true. It's very true because if you really do have a mental health problem, you know, and I'm talking along the lines of being uh, psychosis or borderline personality or what have not, then if you think that you don't have one, you don't. But anyways, you have a good evening. Thanks, Alice. Appreciate it. Uh, no, I mean, you know, at the end of it, uh, you know, I, I talk to myself quite often. Some of the best conversations I ever had. Uh, <laughs> Alice cracks me up. Uh, this, this made me laugh today. Uh, very few things about Trump makes me laugh, but this, and I've got to get the Cassidy Hutchinson book. Uh, I've got to try and find out. Uh, I don't want to buy it, but i got to find out who the publisher is and, and see if we can get them to send us a review copy, maybe get her on the show. Uh, evidently, according to The Guardian, um, do you remember when, you know, when Trump was refusing to wear a mask and, you know, and would go to events without a mask on? Well, it turns out, according to Cassidy Hutchinson, and she's the reason for it, uh, that the reason he didn't wear a mask any, anymore after this visit to a, a factory, um, he, 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 I guess he put on a white mask and then asked one of the staffers what they thought. And what Cassidy Hutchinson writes is, I slowly shook my head. The president pulled the mask off and asked why I thought he should not wear it. Uh, I pointed at the straps of the N95 I was holding. He was looking at the straps of his mask. He saw they were covered in bronzer. <laughs> I'm going to let the laughter go. Uh, evidently, Trump said, why, why did no one else tell me that? I'm not wearing this thing. Uh, evidently, he didn't want to wear a mask because his makeup would, would smudge. His makeup would smudge. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, okay. There you go. Uh, the Lincoln Project, you know, former Republicans turned somewhat sane. Uh, they have a new ad out that's portraying President Biden and his age uh, as an asset. You know, saying, look, his age and, and his experience are an asset. And I agree. I agree his, his experience very much an asset. Age still kind of a problem. But guess what? Age a problem on the other side, too. Uh, do I wish Joe Biden were 20 years younger? Yes. Do I wish he could he could you know, give better speeches? By, by every measure, yes. But here's the thing. The policies that they're moving, I'm thrilled with. Told someone today, you know, just what he's done with the National Labor Relations Board makes me happy. That's the reason to vote for him. The fact that we're going to make, potentially make organizing and and reunite this country by reunionizing, to me, is a great idea. Good thing. Uh, the reason that I am all behind him. Now, the problem is we've got a Republican Party hell-bent on destruction, again, holding the country hostage. And I think right now, you know, we're ticking down less than, less than 10 days towards another shutdown that there doesn't appear to be any end in sight because you have people who really want 
they want to burn the they they want to burn the house down and i've said a million times before these are people who they they want to push the button they they want to they want to flip the switch they they want these are people who would without question you know they do that experiment where you push a button and you don't know it, you could be electrocuting someone or you could be feeding someone you don't know but you just these are the people who just be pushing the button cr like crazy in the hopes that they were electrocuting people because i think that's where their mind goes but Here's the thing, um, quote of the day. Uh, and again, remember, uh, go back to what when Kevin McCarthy was going through all of the fight to become speaker and the, you know, the the, the fifteen or twenty uh, whatever votes it took to make him speaker. I said I want this for him. I truly want him to be speaker. I truly want him to 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 have this honor of waking up every morning thinking about all the crazy people in the kook caucus. Uh, I want him during the daytime to have to deal with all of their shenanigans and nonsense and, you know, people leaving draft uh, draft uh, proposals to throw him out of office in the bathroom. Uh, and then at night when he goes to bed, I want him to think about the last thing he thinks about is Scott Perry and, and his kook caucus doing more things to damage the country. I want him to have the acid reflux. I want him to have the burning throat. I want, I want him to not sleep. Because I want this for him. I want him to be speaker having all of these problems. Uh, now, you've got McCarthy who told reporters about the House voting down a defense bill. He said, this is a whole new concept of individuals that just want to burn the whole place down. That doesn't work. Uh, yeah. And, and you know who knew that before you got the job? The rest of us. So here's an opportunity for, for him to possibly, you know, reach out to Democrats. Will he do it? I doubt it. Uh, but I was thinking about it today. This is about where, where John Boehner would be crying. It's it, Here's the thing. They couldn't even vote to adjourn. They couldn't even vote to allow themselves to go home. That's how dysfunctional our house is right now. That's how dysfunctional the Kevin McCarthy era has been. And is it his fault? No, 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 because the GOP, they've lost their minds. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at thericksmithshow.com. Going to take a quick break. Back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1934. That was the day nearly half a million textile workers from Maine to Alabama walked off the job in a general strike. The United Textile Workers had launched an organizing campaign the year before. Within months, their membership had grown from 15,000 to well over 250,000. Working conditions and pay were abysmal. Normal work weeks averaged 55 hours. Child labor was widespread and workers were always in fear of mill closings, pay cuts, and firings for suspected union activity. In the South, the industry had essentially been in a depression since the early 20s. The key issue was the stretch out. Workers were routinely expected to complete an increasing amount of work at the same rate and wage. For a brief moment, workers hoped their conditions would change when President Roosevelt signed the Code of Fair Competition the previous summer. It raised wages, limited hours, and prohibited child labor. It also allowed for union organizing. But the mill owners maneuvered around the code effectively, and the Textile Relations Board refused most workers' complaints. Fed up, workers walked out of the mill by the hundreds of thousands. They used the flying squadron tactic employed by Minneapolis Teamsters earlier that year, traveling from town to town, from mill to mill, calling workers out on strike. Mill owners were shocked. Within days, strikers confronted thousands of police and scabs. More than 40,000 National Guardsmen were called out in 16 states. Over the course of the strike, 16 people would be killed and hundreds more injured. After 22 days, union leaders called off the strike when President Roosevelt promised a government survey of industry conditions. It was an outrage, a betrayal, and a defeat felt for decades. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Oh, thank God for Ted Cruz. Once again, the far-right-wing U.S. Senator is saving you and me from a political horror that doesn't exist. This is Ted's specialty for 
he seems unable to deal with the real economic and social problems that workaday people actually have. Thus, he constantly tries to divert attention from his senatorial incompetence by staging embarrassing political stunts, such as his furious fulminations against Big Bird, Mickey Mouse, and other fictional characters. Unable to triumph over them, however, Cruz is now conjuring up entirely fictional conflicts to let him, a Harvard-educated elitist, pose as a hero of working-class commoners. Beer drinkers, for example. The cruiser recently swooped onto a Republican TV show squawking like chicken a little that Joe Biden intended to restrict us Americans to only two beers a week. Oh, the horror! What is it with liberals that want to control every damn aspect of your life, squealed the senator, who, by the way, does want government to control every woman's reproductive rights, people's voting rights, the rights of labor, what books people can read, etc., etc. But Ted's in a tizzy over Biden's two-beer limit. Only, there's no such thing. Actually, Biden has said nothing about beer. Zero. Zilch. Joe's kind of busy. You know, Ukraine, global warming, health care, real problems. So, unlike the little senator from Texas, he doesn't have time to play political pickleball. This is Jim Hightower saying, embarrassingly, such other GOP officials as Iowa Senator Joni Ernst have joined Cruz's screwball crusade to stop Biden's non-existent beer bust. It's like they all went to clown school to learn to be senatorial. As for Ted, his nonstop series of nutty PR antics reveals that he is to a real senator what near beer is to beer, only not nearly as close. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So, interesting story over at The Economist. Yes, I, I sometimes read The Economist. Uh, I don't subscribe. Uh, I know, I think it was Sarah Palin who, would, uh, she was asked, you know, what, you know what, what magazines does she read? She threw out The Economist. Yeah. You know, most people don't read the Economist unless they're in the dentist's office, uh, but I happen to I happen to catch this article on on climate change, and 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 look, they're coming at it from an economic standpoint, which is and we've been talking about this for a while. Uh, look at Florida, for instance, uh, insurers are leaving the state. Uh, it's a boom state where you know thousands of people are going. You would think more customers, you know, higher density, more profits, especially considering that Florida's Florida's homeowners policies are probably, I think, are, are right up there with the highest in the country. Uh, they're, what, what did I see the number? Like $6,000 a year uh, is is the number. Uh, the average home, home insurance premium, $6,000. Three times the national average, up 42% year over year. Yeah, yeah. And you would think, hey, what, what, profit, profit, you know, six thousand dollars. That's a huge amount of money. Uh, you would think insurers would be flocking to get people to pay, you know, six thousand dollars a year. Problem is, they're not. In fact, you look at Florida, as we've talked about before. There are, you know, I think at least 15 that have left the state. Uh, or limiting their access in the state. You've got seven others that are insolvent. You've got all these people going, you know, um, maybe not. Maybe maybe we're not. Now, I love I, I love this guy on, I, I, he does one of the, it's, it's one of the, the video, Instagram, TikTok, one of them, uh, you know, Reels, YouTube, whatever. It's one of the short videos. There's this angry dude. And I, I don't know what his name is, but he yells a lot. He's an old guy, wears glasses, always in a suit, and he yells a lot. And, and profanity out the wazoo. And he said, and, I, and I'll never forget this because I, I wish I could find the clip. He said that global warming's a hoax because people are still building in Florida and insurance companies are insure, insuring them and banks are underwriting the loans. If, if, if this were real then no one would underwrite this stuff. And and, and I, I got to find that. So if someone knows where that is, please send it to me. Because this is one of those moments where you go, right now, it's beginning to happen. We're at the beginning of the insurance companies who are in business not to protect you, not to make sure that you're well, 
not to not to make sure that you're you're made whole in the in your moment of crisis they're in business to make money pure and simple they're not in the business of of rebuilding the country and i was i was amazed at this economist article that pointed out in santa clarita 85 percent of the properties in one of the santa clarita uh zip codes were dropped by their insurers between 2015 and 2021 85 percent now you know the thing is is this is one of those those moments where you go um what do people do then if they they can't get insurance well they they sorry you're on your own now understand this is an area that was you know devastated by fires and you know insurers lost their you know what but you know it's always one of these things well you know either act of god or uh we just ran out of money and and then who picks it up the taxpayers we get stuck holding the bag and I'm looking at this story, and again, I, I today I had that conversation with someone who's, who, who bought into the, you know, it's all a hoax, it's all not real, no, no bad things are happening, you're just, you're just looking at the wrong stuff. And I'm going, I don't know, wildfires seem to be more, hurricanes seem to be more, weather seems to be much more extreme, uh, something's happening. Whether you believe it's it's man-made global warming, whether it's just a cycle of things getting getting uh, getting worse, uh, don't care what's happening what's happening is the insur these insurers are going you know what we're not gonna we're not gonna keep losing money now they point out that in Texas you go along with Texas which has been one of the fastest growing states in the in the country um, they're vulnerable to huge storms that form in the Gulf of Mexico you've got Florida who, who grew at a, at, a, a, at a big rate uh, in fact, grew twice as fast as the country did between 20, uh, 20, 2000 and 2020. Uh, they point out that by 2015, the value of insured properties in the Gulf and Atlantic coasts, $13 trillion. Who can insure that? Reality is none of these companies. And we're moving to riskier places. And by moving to riskier places, um, more bad things are happening to people. Uh, you go to an area where you're going to have wildfires, don't be surprised if it happens. You're going to move to an area where there are hurricanes, don't be surprised when there are hurricanes. And you've got these insurers who are going, you know what, we're not going to write as many policies in these vulnerable areas because we don't, we don't want to be on the hook for it. You know, insurance companies sell you an insurance policy hoping you'll never use them. Uh, we've had a homeowner's insurance. I've owned a house a uh, lot. Well, got to be, what, 30? I'd say 30 years. Uh, we filed one claim in 30 years. I know people who have never filed a claim in 30 years. Those are the people that insurance companies want. Not someone who lives in an area where, oh, you know what? Hurricane, you know, knocked, you know, knocked the roof, took the roof off. I need a new roof. Oh, wildfire came by and burned down the the barn and half the house. They don't want that. And the question then becomes: In these places where all of these these people live and have built their their homes and their lives, if insurance companies aren't going to do it because it's not profitable. And interestingly enough, these are in very Republican areas most of the time. Who hate government, by the way who's going to be the backstop and look it's it's you know it's all the coastal states who are in who are in this that becomes the question how much are we willing to be on the hook and still not do anything i mean this is my frustration because this person i was talking to today uh you know believes we shouldn't be doing anything uh, you know, thinks you know elect electric vehicles are terrible, electric heat pumps are terrible, solar panels are ridiculous. You know, just went down this whole list of, um, you know, red hat club member card kind of stuff. And I don't know how in this day and age, you know, hearing stories like this, and we've been talking about this for a while, 
uh, where the moneyed interests are saying, mm, yeah, th things are happening. I don't know when it, it, it shakes us awake to where we do something. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite, quite certain there. But I look at this and, and, you know, even if you don't believe in climate change, what Joe Biden is doing, I think, is important because it's moving us in a direction that, that the next generation of jobs, the next generation of investments, the next generation of moving us to, you know, renewable. I was asking this question today because, I, I, you know, this person told me, well, you know, everyone's bought, they're all bought and paid for, all the politicians. I'm going, well, maybe so. Uh, but who are they bought and paid for by? Are they bought and paid for by people who, who want to help or ones who just want to help themselves? Uh, the oil companies have, have had, you know, the best of times, best of luck, uh, best of fortunes for the last, you know, 50, 100 years. The reason we haven't moved towards, uh, you know, renewable energy is because of the oil companies who want to make sure we're still hooked on the juice. And, you know, I said, look, you know, had we followed Carter's plan, of which by, I think today is his 99th birthday, if I'm not mistaken, and happy birthday, Mr. President. Um, had we followed his vision back in 79 and and put solar panels on homes and, and move towards uh, some, some, some renewable energy sooner, we'd be much further down the road. And, you know, I said, look, you know, we, we start off by mandating all new construction have some bit of energy independence. You start off maybe with you know geothermal, you start off with electric heat pumps, you start off with solar panels on the roof, you know, whatever. But mandate that that every home built, every building built has some measure of renewable energy towards it. You know, every roof should have solar panels. That simple. And you can do that by saying every every new construction building, that's what they gotta have. And then you start moving towards, hey, you know, we're going to incentivize people to put it on their own homes. Uh, I know with our our bill, we produce about 40% of our electricity. Uh, we have a, a reasonable system on our roof. Uh, it's, what, about 12, 13 years old now? I think everyone should, should, be ha should have something like that. Because it'll help get us off of the dirty stuff. It's going to help get us away from you know, from pulling stuff out of the ground. Help make us a little bit more independent. But it's going to slow the growth of our use of oil. It's going to slow the growth. We're not going to. We're. I'm going to make the prediction we're never getting off of oil. It's never going to happen. And I know my environmental friends are going to lose their mind. Yes, we can do it. No, you're not. But maybe slowing it. Maybe you know. You know, even just a, a small cutback is helpful. And we do that by by smart policy. And I know that's all real wonky science stuff that, that they get into. Here's where my thought is. This is the next generation of jobs. This is the next American industry. This this could have been the American industry. Again, you know, Reagan comes in, fires the Patco workers, shot heard across the boardroom, go get those working people. But he also ripped the solar panels off the White House uh, and told Big Oil, hey, you know, the next 40, 50 years, that's uh, that's your present. You're welcome. And look what we've been stuck with. And yeah, I know, I, I get the talking point. Well, we're going to change, we're going to trade Middle East oil for Chinese batteries. We don't have to. We can build those here. And that's what the president's talking about. That's part of the, the jobs part of this, which is why it's a winning message. Bidenomics is a winning message. When you start talking about addressing the climate and creating jobs so that communities that have been left behind for the last several decades have a shot to get ahead, have a shot to grab their identities back, those are winners. And look, I think Biden's got a really good message going into 2024. The fact that our economy created more jobs quickly and did it more, more efficiently and quicker than, than virtually every industrialized country in the world. The fact that our inflation wasn't as bad as mo the rest of the world. I know it's bad. 
but it wasn't as bad as it, it could have been if we had somebody, oh, I don't know, like Donald Hoover Trump. You know, the fact that you've got a president who's talking about, you know, how do we make sure that families can can get by? Uh, you got somebody who's, who wants to not just talk about investment in infrastructure, but actually doing it, actually talking and doing help for small businesses. You know, Biden may not be great on Twitter, but he's better than Trump was on the economy. And like it or not, the economy is moving in the right direction. And in five, ten years, we're going to look back and we're going to be grateful for this moment. Even in the face of all the, the outright wing outrage merchants who want to keep us angry over suits. <laughs> I still can't believe that. Uh, but, you know, Joe Manchin's going to save the country, going to save the world for democracy by wearing a suit. Uh, never mind those kids or, or infrastructure inf investments. But I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. There's a quick, quick break right back after this. Stick around. The phone lines are open. Give Rick a call at 1-866-416-RICK. That's 1-866-416-7425. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1991. That was the day that members of the Culinary Workers Union Local 226 went out on strike against the Frontier Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. What they did not know was that the strike would last for more than six years, becoming one of the longest work actions in U.S. labor history. The Frontier was the second casino to open on the Vegas Strip in 1942. At the time of the strike, the Alardi family owned the historic casino. The Alardis were vehemently anti anti-union. They renovated the old facility and then reopened, refusing to sign a contract to pay its workers the same rate provided at most other Vegas casinos. Claiming that the frontier was too small to match the wages of the larger outfits, management refused to budge from their position. In response, local 226 members mobilized. The year before, Hattie Canty had been elected president of the local. She was a black mother of 10 children and a widow. She had worked as a hotel maid. Her leadership brought a new determination to the Culinary Workers Union. Local 226 set up 24-hour picket lines outside the frontier. The strike was joined by Bartenders Local 165, Teamsters Local 995, the Operating Engineers Local 501, and the Carpenters Local 1780. The strike began became an important moment in Vegas labor history as other casino owners looked on watching the labor battle unfold. The unions stood strong. The picketers demand that the owners should, quote, sell, shut down, or sign became the call. In the end, the Alardis decided to sell. The new ownership signed a union contract and rehired 280 striking workers. Triumphant union members cut a red ribbon at the hotel to mark their victory. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk. So the, uh, the main stream corporate-controlled media still wants to keep feeding us the, uh, the inflation's bad angle, the economy's bad angle. And when I saw David Brooks trending on Twitter today, I, I had to know why. Uh, the New York Times columnist uh, evidently went to Newark Airport and had lunch. Uh, evidently went to the Newark Airport Smashburger. Uh, I've never been there, so I, I don't know. Uh, but he, he tweeted out uh, a picture of his meal, uh, which was, you know, a decent hamburger, some fries, and some, some green stuff, you know, stuff that I guess you might put on a hamburger. Uh, I don't, but some people do. Uh, and uh, it looks like a, uh, he had something of a drink. And he said, this meal just cost me $78 at Newark Airport. This is why Americans think 
the economy is terrible. Now, on its face, you look at this, you go, oh, my God, $78 for a hamburger and a drink. Oh, that's terrible. That's horrible. Now, look, I've been in airports. Airport food's expensive uh, because they know they got you. You're captive. It's not, like you're, it's not like you're going back through security, catching a cab and getting out of the facility and then going back through security. They know you're not going to do that. So, yeah, they're going to jack up the price a little bit. That's going to happen. Uh, but 78 bucks? Holy, wow. What could, what could be in this hamburger? Uh, and I know it's uh, the, the Wagyu beef, and that's, that's a good thing. Um, but as people have decided to look into it, uh, someone posted a, a picture of the menu. And the hamburger itself, with the, with the French fries and all of the lettuce, tomato, and onions, and pickles, and all that, uh, $10.40. That's what the, the meal cost. Uh, seven sixty-five if you just bought the hamburger. Turns out, eighty percent of Brooks' bill was was his bar tab. <laughs> uh, you know, eighty percent of the bill was his bar tab. So my mind went, you know, maybe New York Times maybe need to, oh, I don't know, pull back on David Brooks a bit, maybe a little rehab, or maybe get him another drink and tell him not to. Uh, let's go to the phones. We got Steve on line one from Chicago. Steve, how are you? Yes, thank you for taking my call. And I think that this is a demonstrative of you know where we are in terms of media these days because yeah, there's this rush to get things off there, to get them in print, to get them on the air, and that's why they say that you know uh, that journalism is history's first take on everything. Now the problem is that in our rush to get everything out there, you know, we sometimes forget to do things like fact checking. Or, you know, putting things into context. Or you know, sobering I, I up. I travel a lot. And yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I I do a lot of traveling. So, yeah, you're exactly right. You know, ever since 9-11, you, they know that, you know, there's an inside and an outside the airport. Inside the airport is like its own little prison. And you're not going to go back through security, as you point out, to go out and get a bite somewhere. And that means that the people who actually have the licenses to serve food in, in airports, it's a, it's a license to steal in many ways. You're stuck. And let's face it, if your flight is delayed and, you know, it, it's going off in three hours, you're not leaving the airport. You're going to sit there, you're going to find something to eat at the airport. And then you might also have something to drink. And a lot of people do in order to pass the time. And then they wonder why their bill is so high. But uh, I mean, this idea that, you know, that all of a sudden this is something new, I, you know, again, context matters. What did he have to drink? You know, I can have, uh, you know, three drinks for 30 bucks. Or I could have one great uh, uh, shot of scotch for 30, uh, for 30, 40 bucks. So it, uh, it was 12 year old scotch, about. is what they didn't, okay. they didn't <laughs> name what it was, but it was 12 year old scotch. <laughs> yeah, which isn't great scotch, by the way, but okay. And, but at the airport, they're going to jack up that price significantly. And, and, and quite frankly, any bar, they're going to do that. So yeah, I, I mean, these are, these are real first world problems. It, it, that's the other point I wanted to make because it's amazing that this is where we are. That you know these are people who can afford to travel, do travel, and uh, this is their this is their gripe in life. Oh my God, I was stuck at an airport and I drank and ate more than I thought I should have, or didn't look at the prices, and this was my bill. Well, gee, I mean, uh, let me cry you a river. Uh, perhaps you could ask somebody in the Ukraine if they'd be willing to send you some money, because you know there's nobody else suffering in the world. I mean, come on. I mean, a little bit of context here. Yeah, but no, the, but it's it's the outrage candy, Steve. Uh, they've got you've got to keep feeding people the outrage candy so that they can be upset about things, and just not the right things. You know, like I started off with today. Right. You know, Joe Manchin's out there. He's fighting to save the suit, Steve. He's fighting <laughs> to save the suit. Screw those kids that are going hungry. But you know, at least the people who took the food from them, they'll be wearing suits. Yeah, I mean, and somehow the, the, all of this will fun into some sort of uh, fault of labor or people who are, you know, somebody who dropped out of high school and they're working in that kitchen back there and demanding $40 an hour. So that's why your bar tab at the airport and restaurant tab was so high. I mean, that's, that's invariably what happens with this, this stuff. Yeah, we had to pay those people a lot of money, so that's really where your money went. Not that somebody's price gouging you at the airport <laughs> because they got, we, we, I'm here in Chicago and we have had decades a scandal with regard to how a lot of restaurants got those gigs. There's only so much that are two major airports, and uh, we've had investigation after investigation as to how exactly did they get these gigs where you've got 
uh, millions of people who are trapped in this location with no alternative. So, yeah, I, you know, there, it's a recipe for corruption as to no end. I, I'm with you. Appreciate it, Steve. Thanks so much, man. Thank you. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, it is. It's 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 a license to. You would argue to print money. You know, it, well, steal. <laughs> He's right. Uh, I, w- I want to end this this hour on uh, good on the UAW. Um, and, and we're going to talk uh, about the strike here in the next hour. But good on the UAW. Uh, Sean Fain uh, filed charges uh, with the National Labor Relations Board uh, against Tim Scott for his comments. Uh, because, you know, look, you, you can't you can't you can't do what he did. Uh, telling workers that they'll all be fired for striking is a violation of federal labor law. And, and it's, it's not something becoming of a senator. Uh, according to uh, to Fane. Uh, and, and look, you know, if you listen to Tim Scott's spiel, you know, invoking, you know, Ronald Reagan, you know, Reagan fired those Patco workers. Uh, you know, Tim Scott's going, no, you can, we can fire anybody. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where this goes. Uh, do I think anything's going to come of it? I don't. But the idea that someone is finally standing up and fighting back gives me great hope. Uh, but again, you know, the, 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 the complaint accuses Scott of violating uh, the section of the NLRA that, that lays out employees' rights to participate in labor actions. Uh, within the past six months, they write, the employer has interfered with, restrained, or coerced employees in the exercise of the rights guaranteed in Section 7 of the Act. Uh, on Monday, September 18th, 2023, Tim Scott threatened employees with adverse consequences if they engaged in protected, concerted activity by publicly responding to a question about striking workers uh, as follows. You strike, you're fired. Uh, With Jennifer Abruzio at the the, the NLRB, uh, I gotta gotta wonder where this goes. And could this be precedent setting? Because look, when the Republican debate happens, uh, when this comes up here in a couple of days, at the Reagan Library, you don't think they're going to be all tripping over each other to regurgitate that theme? We should fire all those workers who have the audacity to want better. Oh. And then the guy who's going to probably be the nominee is a scab across the picket line. Go figure. Going to take a quick break. Right back. We must phase out coal, oil, and gas in a fair and equitable way and massively boost renewables. World nations grapple with climate change at UN General Assembly. We will use our energy dominance to deny our enemies revenue. DeSantis vows to unleash fossil fuels while downplaying climate change. This is not about the politics. This is about doing what's right for the country in the long term. Conservative UK Prime Minister weakens Britain's climate policies. Plus, President Biden launches the first ever American Climate Corps. All of those launches and more straight ahead from Bradblog.com. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyan. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and snarky comment. The future is not fixed. Right. It's broken. We're kind of hoping you guys might help fix it. This is your Green News Report. Okay, Desi Doyen, summer is wrapping up here in the U.S. A long, cruel summer. It's just getting started in Australia, but I understand things are not looking good down under already. No, unfortunately, Australia is dealing with a scorcher. A spring heat wave is shattering records with temperatures 20 to 25 degrees hotter than average and putting dozens of runners in the Sydney Marathon in the hospital for heat exhaustion this week. In politics, in a Texas oil field on Wednesday, Republican 2024 presidential candidate and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis downplayed climate change in unveiling his energy agenda, vowing to withdraw the United States from global climate pacts and the U.S. commitment to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions, expand extraction of fossil fuels on the public's lands, and slash federal regulations on pollution and conservation to boost domestic fossil fuel production. He did that 
in the middle of an oil field. Yep. DeSantis also said that as president, he'd bring gas prices down to $2 a gallon, <laughs> a difficult prospect given that oil prices are set on the global market. <laughs> In international diplomacy, at the United Nations General Assembly underway in New York, U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres warned that current government actions to cut dangerous climate warming emissions are, quote, falling abysmally short, even as the world just had a rash of deadly extreme weather disasters and its hottest summer on record. Guterres called on nations to enact key steps, like ending billions in annual subsidies for fossil fuels, implementing a price on carbon, and assisting developing countries with adaptation and mitigation projects. Guterres targeted wealthy, high-emitting countries and their obligations to address the crisis they created. G20 countries are responsible for 80% of greenhouse emissions. They must lead. They must break their addiction to fossil fuels. To stand the fighting chance of limiting global temperature rise, we must phase out coal, oil and gas in a fair and equitable way and massively boost renewables. Yeah, but here was my favorite comment from Guterres. Humanity has opened the gates of hell. Yeah, I think he's got it about right. President Biden addressed the U.N. on Tuesday, focusing on deadly extreme weather disasters around the world and highlighted the surge in historic U.S. climate actions under his administration. From new funding to assist developing countries to adapt to climate impacts and transition to new energy and new policies under the Democrats' landmark climate law, the Inflation Reduction Act. Last year, I signed into law in the United States the largest investment ever anywhere in the history of the world to combat the climate crisis and help move the global economy toward a clean energy future. But we need more investment on public and private sector alike, especially in places that have contributed so little to global emissions but face some of the worst effects of climate change. In the UK, Conservative Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who was not at the UN summit, this week backtracked on the UK's successful climate policies. He rolled back a 2030 ban on gas and diesel cars to 2035 mm. and rolled back upgrading energy efficiency projects and transitioning to electric heat pumps. UK climate scientists said the rollback puts the country's legally binding 2050 net zero target in jeopardy and energy experts said it will prolong the UK's dependence on fossil fuels and damage its growing clean energy industries. What the hell is he thinking? That's an excellent question. Thank you. And finally, good news for America. President Biden used his executive authority to create the first ever American Climate Corps, a paid green jobs training and service program for young adults modeled after the Depression era Civilian Conservation Corps. A key goal of youth climate campaigners, the Climate Corps will employ more than 20,000 young adults to build projects in clean energy, conservation, and climate resilience, like restoring coastal wetlands wildfire prevention, and building out solar and wind projects. Very, very cool. Yes. For much more on all of these stories and the ones we couldn't get to today, check out our website at greennews.bradblog.com. Are you tired of think tank approved corporate news and commentary? Are you tired of CEOs telling you what to think, who to hate, and who to vote for? Well, welcome to the Rick Smith Show. We don't take orders from some boardroom, and we don't do focus groups or talking points. We don't work for them, and we never will. I'm Rick Smith, and I work for you. Join us daily at thericksmithshow.com and download the podcast and never miss a minute. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So on Saturday, we're going to be heading out to Toledo. You're on board KCAA's Inland Talk Express. KCAA, Loma Linda, 1050 AM, the station that leaves no listener behind. Are you underpaid and overworked? Is a living wage and employee benefits like affordable health care more of a dream than a reality for you and your family? If so, it's time to form a union. Don't be denied the wages and benefits you deserve. Come together in a union with the power of numbers. A union is not a privilege. It's your right, and it will make a difference. Contact Teamsters Local 1932, a powerful and successful labor union in San Bernardino, by visiting Teamsters1932.org backslash organize to start today. 
NBC News Radio, I'm Lisa Taylor. The United Auto Workers are expanding their strike. Michael Kastner has more.